India's capital, New Delhi, is in the final stages of preparation for the G20 summit that concludes, of course, India's presidency of the grouping. We asked NewsClick's editor in chief, Praveer Pukayastha, what the context of the G20 really is and whether this is the right platform to even potentially address the economic realities of the world today. And the ASEAN summit begins in Jakarta on Tuesday. Most notable so far is the absence of US President Joe Biden, China's Xi Jinping, and even Thailand's new Prime Minister. What then is on the agenda at the ASEAN summit, and are we likely to see any real resolutions on the key issues facing the region? This is Daily Debrief coming to you, as always, from the People's Dispatch studios here in New Delhi. New Delhi, among the largest cities in the world, is gearing up to come to an almost complete halt as world leaders, particularly those from the West, arrive for the head, head of state summit that will conclude India's year in the chair of the Global Economic Club, that is the G20. We go over now to NewsClick Editor-in-Chief Prabhi Purkayastha for a bit of a curtain raiser on what to expect over these two days. Hi Prabhi, good to have you uh, back with us on Daily Debrief. Uh, New Delhi is shaping up or, or gearing up rather for uh, the jamboree that is the summit of the G20 grouping of, of nations and uh, of course the population 30 or so million including uh, migrant workers who come in and out of India's capital uh, set to face a significant set of difficulties particularly the poorest section uh, among Delhi's population but before we get into some of that uh, set the context for us Prabir. Uh, what exactly is the G20 and where does it stand amid uh, all of the various organizations and, and multilateral, uh, multinational platforms uh, that exist in the world today? You know, G20 really came out of the 2008 financial crisis when G7 uh, countries realized that they were not in a position by themselves to overcome the crisis. Mm. They needed countries like China, like India, who had sufficient foreign exchange reserves and a banking system which should help them get out of the crisis of their sinking banks. If you remember, it started with what is called the mortgage crisis, mm. but it soon engulfed the banking system, both in the United States and in Europe. Mm. So they needed financially to be bailed out by countries which had sufficient reserves of foreign exchange and to show up some of these banks. So that was the limited remit of G20. And if you remember, G7 itself was not supposed to be a political platform. In fact, it included Russia before that mm. and that had become G8. Russia mm. was kicked out soon enough uh, for various reasons, which we won't get into. But it again became G7. But, you know, G7 has been a club even as G20 is a club because there were the uh, European countries and the United States, essentially, and Canada. So they were what new statesmen call the white boys club. Mm. This is what I would call ex-colonial powers and uh, neo-colonial powers getting mm. together. And that's really the United States and its European allies, mm. along with Australia, uh, Canada, and its other, you know, some countries like that. So when G20 is to be seen, we have to see it in the context of what G7 represented. And it represented a club which would then call, say, and it has been saying now for some time, that we have what would be called the global rules, the rule-based order. Mm. And the rule-based order is not done by an international body like the United Nations mm. or international law, which is you know, something you negotiate and say, okay, this is the legal framework that all of us agree. But it's a set of rules which are never stated. But the rule-based order means we make the rules and you have to follow it. Mm. So it's, it's like the constitution, I guess, of the United Kingdom, where there is no written constitution. But in this case, at least there are the courts who define the law. Here, the United States and its allies really determine what is the rule-based order, who makes the rules, and who violates the rules. Mm. If US intervenes in various countries, it's not a violation of uh, the rules. 
Yeah. But if Russia, for instance, has got into Ukraine war, then of course it's a violation of the rules, but that's only a small part. Much bigger part is the rule-based order by which the United States today has probably sanctioned about one third of the world. Mm. Now, those are the kind of problems that we get into. And therefore, G20 is still uh, something which can work with consensus, otherwise it cannot work. That's a basic understanding. But the rules of the game are not defined. So mm. this is really a set of intentions. And in that sense, it's no different, for instance, from the BRICS, again, which meet and decide what it agrees on, what it doesn't agree on. And that's the kind of the platform that G20 is to be. But this has become, as we saw in Bali, a yeah. platform by which to mobilize countries against Russia. This seems to be the limited objective of at least the United States and European Union. And of course, there are a number of countries against India, including Brazil, who would say a war should be stopped. Mm. That is one part of it. But yeah. does it mean that therefore you say, okay, now you, Russia, stop the war, but Ukraine has no responsibility for it unlike what you did in the Minsk Accords when there was a decision to bring together uh, Ukraine and Russia. Now we understand both France and Germany to say it is only to buy time to mm. arm and military, you know, help the military in the Ukraine. So if we take all of that out, this is not the platform in which you will decide the Ukraine war. It has to be something which has to be decided at the level of the United Nations or between NATO countries, Ukraine and Russia. And that's not something other countries have too much of a role to play. I think that's the background of what the expectations of each side is. And I think India is trying to get a kind of agreed draft. In fact, we agreed with the Bali draft, which was proposed. China did not and Russia did not. Russia did not. So that's where the things still probably lie. And mm. there are, it, we will not know what the agreement and disagreements are, but behind the scenes, I'm sure the various Sherpas are working to get a certain kind of draft, which it could then come out as India's uh, statesmanship, having got a unified draft, if such a draft does come through. But the portents of that, because neither Putin nor Xi Jinping is here, it doesn't seem to be that bright that we will get a complete unanimity. We may get something like the Bali draft with exceptions, which some countries will not agree to. Uh, which brings us to what is likely to be the central theme. You have, of course, talked already of the war in Ukraine, uh, Prabir. And despite it not being the, the platform to discuss that sort of international politics, uh, it is likely to be uh, the sticking point and, and India's sort of diplomatic prowess and also maneuvering over the past year as it's assumed these, this sort of rotational presidency of this grouping uh, perhaps will be highlighted and already commentators uh, pointing out just as you have uh, that uh, perhaps lack of consensus would be looked at as uh, a bit of a failure on that front. Well, you know, the, given the world situation today, a consensus cannot be reached easily, not as far as the Ukraine war is concerned, as long as the United States and the European Union or NATO countries think mm. they can bleed Russia out. And that will be defeating a defeat of Russia. And the costs are being borne by Ukraine, as some of the US leaders have said. Well, you know, for us, the cost is much less. After all, we are only spending about 3% of our budget or GDP. Now, that's a small cost for destroying Russia. Now, mm. if that is the framing of it. Then the expectation is the war will continue. And there is no, in that sense, there is no meeting ground between the two sides. Now, if that is the understanding, then of course, irrespective of what the other 18 countries may want, we're not going to get a resolution on this issue. The question is, are there any other issues? Now, here is the issue. Any other issue are not the ones that the West is interested in. Mm -hmm. And the Western powers, in fact, are a very important section of the G20. If yeah. you see, the African Union has one seat. Okay, mm. if you take European Union, well, it's there as European Union as well as various European countries. Country. Okay, so they get a, get a number of seats at the table. Mm. Then, of course, you have the United States, the big brother all by himself, mm. and you also have Canada. So, given all of that, 
it is it does not reflect the economic strength of the countries and if g20 as well as g7 were economic platforms mm. then the current world doesn't look like what it did 20 years back Absolutely. now that is a significant part of what is being missed out if you see for instance simply the economic weight of g7 or g7 plus the european union countries you know if you take that and look at it by the uh, asian countries today that's china india saudi arabia indonesia you will see that the world has has changed significantly from that age which you know at that time g7 was about 41 percent of the global economy Mm. It's much less. Mm. So, and it's also true, the BRICS countries, the economic weight is today bigger than that of G7. Even if you leave out the expanded BRICS, the original BRICS itself in PPP terms. So given all of that, the, if this is to be wielding an economic uh, agenda, then the economy, the economic power of the countries are very different today. And the fact that Africa, you, the whole of African continent is represented by just South Africa, itself makes a huge statement. And the European Union is there, but African Union is not. And that's why I think India has put forward the idea that African Union should be part of the G20. Mm. So these are some of the issues which are very glaring. And this, you know, they really hit you in the face that mm. is the neo-colonial vision of the world is, is that to continue uh, is there going to be a different way of looking at the world unfortunately if you're looking at europe and you're looking at the united states it doesn't seem to be so because you take borel european union uh, head who said we are a garden the rest of the world is a jungle mm. who are trying to enter the garden now mm. that is the framing Same if word. that is the framing then, you know, the jungle has something to say on that. And yeah. I think that is the problem that the European countries and the United States and Canada, Australia, its mm. various allies have to face. But this is not the world that a large number of countries in the world would like to continue. And some rebalancing of economic forces have to take place within such groupings. And I would say G7, G20, really represent the past and the fact that india has put a lot of stake into it is in fact not going to lead it to the kind of results it's looking for because this is a platform which really does not today represent what's happening in the world in the world oh, which uh, maybe brings us to a concluding point uh, from you to be on uh, the expanding BRICS, uh, as well as other regional cooperation organizations. We've talked about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in the past. Uh, there's an ASEAN summit happening in Southeast Asia uh, as well. And all, all of these groupings uh, are more than just clubs. They are based on some sort of uh, understanding of international law that, that is, you know, uh, based on years of negotiation and, and understanding and debate around uh, issues involving multiple nations. Uh, how, how do you then uh, look at the tightrope that, in a way, India is trying to walk uh, by balancing, of course, uh, its uh, existing relationships with Russia and, and, and uh, also, of course, its trade with China, uh, but trying to keep the United States and, and uh, Western democracies uh, also on its side and, and, and sort of batting for both teams, as it were? That's the argument that has been made by the Indian foreign minister that we are involved in multiple alignments, not non-alignment, but multiple alignments. And that means on certain issues, we'll go with certain countries or certain other issues, we'll go with other countries. So, okay, I mean, I do think that what came out of the national movement was non-alignment mm. and the still the reworking of the global relations, particularly with respect to Africa, still remains on the agenda. Yeah. And that's why you have right now neo against the neo-colonial regime that France introduced yeah. in its former colonies, mm. you are saying revolts takes place. And it does seem the United States doesn't know which way to go. Mm. It cannot abandon France at the same time it cannot go with it. So it's sort of caught in a kind of bind over there. Mm. So this is the kind of colonial baggage a lot of the countries carry, not India. 
And I would say the Soviet Union in that sense had a huge role to play in African national liberation struggles. A lot of the credit still goes to Russia. How much mm. they can claim or not claim is a different issue. Mm. But they do look upon Russia, therefore, favorably because of their anti-colonial past. So I do not think this multiple alignment part is something which is in the long term sustainable. Because at the end of it, the real issues today, economic terms, it's yeah. not just India's economy. India is a continental-sized economy. It can do a lot of things by itself, just by as itself. like China could do. And yeah. Russia has so shown that it can do. But yeah. ASEAN countries, you have mentioned, if you have a look at the map, you will see they're all island nations except Malaysia. Yeah. And Malaysia is actually a projection into the Indian Ocean. Yeah. So they're really a part of that grouping, which has for a long time believed that trade is the answer yeah. to their identities. And they are, have been trading nations for a long time. Yeah. And they therefore wanted to also have trading relationship with the United States as well as China. And if you remember, it was the United States who pulled out of that. Mm. So ASEAN is going to be economic terms very important. And RCEP means that they're also with China economically, just as Japan is, just as South Korea is. So right. that is one part. Look at the other part. We've already talked about West Asia's economic importance. Yeah. We're talking today about Africa's economic importance. Look at Central Asia's economic importance. So all these are going to play a much more important role in the future, economically. Mm. And the question is, what is European Union countries going to do? What is the United States going to do? What is Australia, Canada, the outliers going to do is still an issue. But it is an issue which they have to face up to much mm. more than the rest of the world has to face up to. Because the rest of the world really knows where to go. They want yeah. independent economies. They do not want to be dominated. They don't want to be sanctioned beyond based on which side of the Ukraine war you are or not. Absolutely. So that is, I think, the issue that's going to increasingly confront. And these are the issues also coming up in G20 in different ways. And African Union inclusion being one of those issues which are more or less, I would call, the weather wave, which way the wind will blow. I think that we will have to see. Right. Thanks very much, Prabir. And we will, of course, be covering uh, the G20 summit uh, over the next few days on Daily Debrief and People's Dispatch at large. Prabir, you wanted to add something? The fact that uh, the Chinese Prime Minister and the uh, Russian president Pardon. is not coming yeah. means that there is not going to be a resolution, for instance, yeah. of the Ukraine issue. And we are going to get something like a Bali resolution still. Yeah, but probably even that watered down uh, from the language that was used in Bali itself. Uh, they said that this, uh, this paragraph is not agreed to by yeah. all. So that kind of, uh, you know, what shall we say, maneuver. To say yeah. we agree to disagree kind of maneuver might be there. And India probably will agree to what the Bali para was, which China and uh, Russia did not agree. Did not agree. All right. Thanks very much, Prabir. We'll leave it there for today. And it's a busy week for diplomatic Sherpas working behind the scenes to build consensus on key issues in Southeast Asia, including, of course, the lack of moves towards peace in Myanmar and ongoing concerns regarding the South China Sea subject on which there has been some positive movement in the recent past, but plenty of negotiations still remain. Anish covers the region for People's Dispatch. Let's go over, over to him now for a bit of a curtain raiser on the Jakarta summit. Anish, we were talking to uh, News Click Editor-in-Chief Prabir Purkayastha a little while earlier about the upcoming G20 summit uh, in the Indian capital in New Delhi. Uh, and in that conversation, of course, regional groupings came up and, and, and formed a major part of, you know, how some of these clubs operate versus actual multilateral organizations. Uh, the ASEAN summit uh, kicking off on Tuesday in the Indonesian capital, Jakarta. Um, and Biden not attending, Anish, how much of an impact is that likely to have on uh, the, the idea of unity and, and sort of uh, the, at least the, the photo ops? that uh, this 10-member nation might have wanted to put out before uh, before the summit goes ahead? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting uh, kind of uh, set of conditions that the ASEAN meeting is happening right now. Obviously, Biden's absence is one thing. There's also Xi's absence. Xi Jinping is not going to be part of the meeting either. 
So what you will have is the only other major countries probably will be India, obviously, and this definitely, uh, this most likely to be Japan uh, in involvement I, as well, uh, participation in the meetings. But uh, like these countries are not the main issue. Like the member nations are the ones who pretty much decide the uh, agenda, what is going to be uh, set in the, uh, like what kind of course of action they will be taking uh, for the next year or so. And uh, in the current agenda, definitely uh, the two issues obviously come to mind uh, for uh, and is, is something that is overshadowing the discussions right now. One is obviously Myanmar, where uh, the, the ASEAN grouping has failed to actually uh, bring out any kind of peace or stability or any action plan that could be workable and, you know, also bring the military regime and the uh, the militant opposition uh, in, together in some ways for uh, a peace uh, that can have some level of resolution in the uh, near future. And this, despite the five point consensus that they've created, uh, we have seen absolutely no uh, absolutely no movement on that uh, on that part. And uh, it is quite interesting also to note how there is uh, definitely the, the the consensus broke. Uh, Immediately after it was agreed upon, we seen uh, Thailand actually, uh, you know, closing up to the military generals, uh, you know, taking a, a more or less equidistant uh, position on the matter uh, as well in many ways, uh, especially in international forum. And obviously, the new Thai prime minister is not attending the meeting either. And then you also have other similar kind of uh, discussions about how much you can actually impose a sort of action plan on a country that is not willing to take on mm. uh, whatever uh, you are proposing to them. Mm. And that is something where you obviously have the limitations of first regional groups coming in. And definitely the other is the South China Sea, which is not necessarily an ASEAN problem. Like the, there is a handful of nations within ASEAN who have, who are part of the, uh, the set of uh, disputes on the South China Sea, but it's not something that ASEAN as a whole can really come uh, up with, like Indonesia, for instance, has no standing on the matter either and does not want to be involved or dragged into the matter. But this is definitely something where you see like uh, more pro-US governments like the Philippines uh, wanting an ASEAN bloc to, you know, uh, to come up uh, as a unified front against China, obviously mm. coming with the sort of, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, necessities of that government at the current moment. Right. So, but we have uh, reported on sort of uh, some forward movement on negotiations uh, on the South China Sea. Uh, Anish, is that likely to sort of continue? And you did point out that ASEAN may not be the right forum for it, but uh, definitely it will be one of the major topics of discussion. How do you see things proceeding? Yes, a previous, uh, we, earlier this year, actually, we talked about a couple of months ago, we talked about this uh, you know, progress that actually did happen with China and so, uh, several of the countries, including Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and Malaysia. But the issue is, uh, Philippines kind of the very sees uh, where we saw recent tensions with Philippines uh, and China, uh, kind of you know derailing the entire uh, problem uh, altogether. Now there is this kind of. On multiple issues, there are uh, like we, we we do not need to delve into which side is uh, which side was right or which side was wrong. But there is a, a definite need for both sides to actually agree upon the fact that they cannot uh, resolve this conflict, uh, this resolve this dispute with an armed conflict or any kind of armed confrontation or military confrontation. They have to actually deal with it in a diplomatic matter with, you know, with other uh, stakeholders involved, other people who are actually staking claims on these islands as well. And mm -hmm. these, uh, and this is something that we are not seeing, especially with the Philippines, there is no uh, intention or no, uh, you know, willingness to, uh, to go for that option. Mm -hmm. Rather, they want more, uh, to internationalize this issue more and more. So ASEAN is this latest forum. They have already uh, dragged in Australia recently. And on top of that, Japan and the United States as, as well. So this is uh, Philippines part is basically to derail the matters even further by bringing in foreign powers who have, who have no say in the matter, who have no stakes in the matter, who only have this 
quote unquote uh, free and uh, open uh, pacific indo pacific uh, agenda which is pretty much them saying that they do not want sovereign rights of any countries to be recognized as long as it uh, you know uh, conflicts with their interest uh, as well so this is uh, something that philippines and like other countries as well need to recognize that they cannot really have that kind of uh, you know any kind of lasting resolution if they're not going to they're not willing to talk and uh, are more willing to drag in other people mm. who are not necessarily either willing or who are not somebody who should who, who are right to be in that situation either in this dispute either so this is something that we are seeing as a kind of deadlock on right now and you know obviously nothing is going to move forward on the asean front earlier we had the same kind of uh, voices being raised but nothing happened mm. um, but in the case and this clearly shows like a severe set of limitations within asean because we are talking about you know a diverse range of countries with diverse political systems uh, and each of them having their own national and geopolitical interests mm-hmm. and there is something like there are certain things that they can definitely agree on but uh, when it comes to some very pressing matters they might find themselves uh, better off doing it on different forums or different multilateral negotiations rather than you know use this as sort of a political block to begin with All right. Thanks very much, Anish. Uh, looks like a week ahead of diplomatic wrangling and also diplomatic probably stalemates uh, that we'll be seeing from Indonesia uh, to India as the week progresses. Uh, we'll of course keep uh, you updated on developments on daily debrief and on the other shows and the other work we do on People's Dispatch. Uh, thanks for joining us, Anish, today. And that's a wrap on this episode of the Daily Debrief. As always, we urge you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Don't also forget to give us a follow on the social media platforms of your choice. We'll be back with another episode of your favorite uh, news and analysis show, same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.